Goddag og velkommen til endnu et foredrag i forum. Og øh, ja, måske skal vi starte med at sige, at for et par år siden havde vi en foredragsrække, vi kaldte Nye Veje Psykiatrie, som der var mange, der var, fik meget ud af, og det var også spændende for os i forum, fordi vi lærte mange folk at kende fra England og USA og andre steder i verden, og fik mange spændende kontakter og blev klar over, at der faktisk sker rigtig meget på det her område i de her år. Øhm, så på forskellige opfordringer af vores egne interesser har vi valgt igen at lave nogle foredrag med psykiatrien som, øh, som centrum. Også fordi, at øh, psykiatrien er en af de områder, hvor at, at nogle af psykologiens kan man sige, grundproblemer virkelig kommer frem. Sammenstød mellem naturvidenskaberne og de mere psykosociale tilgange. Og en af de spørgsmål, der også er det, det er jo så det her omkring, om sådan noget som psykose eller skizofreni er en, en, har en biologisk årsag, eller kun en biologisk årsag, eller i hvilken grad, at øh, folks oplevelser og traumer spiller, det er også en af de øh, definerende grundspørgsmål, kan man sige. Så, øh, og i sidste foredragsrække, den her nye vejpsykiatri, der fik vi også kontakt med det danske stemmehørnetværk, som vi har, har øh, ja, haft god glæde af at lave nogle samarbejder med siden, og øh, det er også Olga, fra, der er formand for stemmehørnetværket, der har skaffet kontakt til John Reed i dag. Uh, og ja, så vil jeg lade dig introducere ham. And I'll do that in English. Um, it's my great pleasure to invite my very good friend John Reed uh, to uh, Copenhagen University. I think it's the first that you are going to be speaking here. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure that it's on behalf of the Hearing Voices Network, the Danish Hearing Voices Network. I uh, uh, first uh, really got to know John Reed's books, I, and I used him extensively in my uh, in my thesis. Uh, and one of the things I, I used was I was very inspired by uh, uh, the research that you you did along with Jim Geeky, looking at the subjectivity of uh, the experience of being labeled schizophrenic. And one of the extraordinary things I found out was that from 1950 to the end of 2012, I went through five databases. Uh, based on uh, being inspired by you, uh, that there were, I only found 14 research articles that were actually interested in the experience of taking psychiatric drugs as a person who is labelled uh, schizophrenic, which is quite extraordinary. And I'm sure, as I say, I've missed a few, but it means that basically there is no interest whatsoever in how people who are labelled schizophrenic experience their treatment. It is a top-down uh, description, which I think is uh, quite interesting. And that's why I know John Reed is going to introduce some ideas that might explain also why we are so afraid of looking at uh, uh, the criticism of, for example, psychiatric drugs. And maybe that there's also a reason why uh, there's so many people who don't really want them, but want to go other routes and other ways. So I am so happy to welcome you all the way from Australia uh, to talk about the connection between uh, psychosis and uh, trauma and psychosis. So thank you very much. It's uh, it's really nice to be here. Thanks for coming out on an evening after the end of a short, busy days that you had. And thank you for allowing me to speak in English. I'm, I'm sorry, I have no Danish at all, so I appreciate that. So just by way of introduction, I, very briefly, I, I worked um, uh, as a clinical psychologist and a, a manager of mental health services in England, America, and, and New Zealand for about 20 years before I went back into academia. And um, during those 20 years, uh, I would find that repeatedly, if I was able to establish a relationship with people who had this thing that psychiatrists call schizophrenia, which doesn't actually exist, but we'll come on to that. Um, if I could establish a relationship, and that was the hard part, um, they would very, in other words, would very often tell me horror stories of things that had gone on in their lives. Um, so when I 
got into academia, it was clear to me what it was I wanted to focus most of my research around, because there wasn't very much research about that, because as we know, this thing called schizophrenia, which doesn't exist, is an entirely biological phenomenon with uh, a very powerful genetic basis, and it has nothing to do with life events. So it's not surprising that there wasn't much research about that. So um, I've given this talk a rather provocative title, I suppose, Who is Right About the Causes of Psychosis, Psychiatrists or Their Patients? Um, and actually, there is a, a real struggle going on around the world between, uh, and I'll, I'll show you that it's between a tiny minority of people who believe that there is a thing called schizophrenia and it is a biological genetic phenomenon, and everybody else, including patients. Um, and it's a very important struggle because um, it determines uh, the, li the outcome of the lives of millions of people around the world. So maybe that's a provocative way of putting it, but there certainly is a struggle going on. So here's the four areas I'll try and get through tonight, but I will leave um, quite a lot of time for discussion as well. So we will talk about causal beliefs first, which is different from actual causes, but there's some very interesting research about what the public believe causes these things. Um, then we'll talk about what the actual causes are, and we'll talk about the effects of those causes, the relationship between those, uh, between causal beliefs and stigma, and we'll talk about what really matters most, which is what are the implications of all of that for treatment and how we how we respond to people in society when they do odd things, when they hear voices that we can't hear, or when they have ideas that might seem a bit odd. How do we respond to them? Um, because the implications of all these issues that, uh, are quite important in that regard. So um, let's get the advertising out of the way. Um, obviously, in the amount of time I've got, I'll only be able to present some of the research that supports um, the statements um, that I'll be making. If you are interested in this area, this book is written by 23 of us um, from about 10 countries, in including um, psychiatrists um, and people who use services. So you might be interested in that. The two organizations I would draw your attention to if you're particularly interested in psychosis is the professional one, which is the International Society for Psychological and Social Approaches to Psychosis. Then there's the International Hearing Voices Network, and Olga was just talking about the local um, branch of that. Um, and this is the journal um, that I edit. I have no idea why that's there. That's just pure narcissism. <laughs> um, anyway, so we'll start with this guy. It's all his fault. It's always good to have people to blame. Uh, scapegoats. It's all, the, the mess we are in today is entirely this one person's fault. Emil Kreplin, who taught psychiatrists how to ignore the social context. Um, he, he wrote uh, several versions of his psychiatric textbook. Um, the final version had 200 pages of symptoms of the illness that he invented. <laughs> he thought he'd discovered an illness. It was clearly um, an invention. 200 pages of symptoms. And we'll, uh, I'll read you about 190 pages of them later, not, not all of them. Anyway, here's an example, a, a rather silly example of how he taught psychiatrists for the next 100 years to ignore the social context. This is not a very good picture because it's 100, more than 100 years old. It's a picture of um, the symptom of his new illness called waxy flexibility, which in turn is a symptom of catatonia, catatonic schizophrenia. These guys have been stood like that for several hours. So it is a bit mad, it's a bit crazy. Um, until you uh, find out the social context. And the social context is, and to be fair to Kreplin, he did actually ask them, why, why do you stay like that? I have to do it, said a patient. It happens to order. What, what they're talking about is how Kreplin told them to stand like that. Now, at this time in history, your chances of getting out of a psychiatric hospital lifetime were about 50-50. Who decides whether you get out? 
when that person tells you to do something, do you do it? Probably. I would, because I would want to go home. Um, but if you do do it, it's, a, it's an example of involuntary obedience. Which is a symptom of schizophrenia. The next example he gives, and the page cuts it off, I'm afraid, but the next example of that is um, uh, he, can, he continues to put out his tongue when commanded to do so, even though I threaten to stab it with a needle. Okay, so you've got one human being with a needle <laughs> telling another human being, stick your tongue out, I'm going to stab it. And the other one... So if you bring a Martian down from Mars and ask them which of these two human beings is mad, <laughs> I suggest the Martian might say both. Um, so 200 pages. I'm, I am going to read you some, not, don't worry, not all of the 200 pages. Um, these are important because we still have this term from 110 years ago in another country, long, uh, not so far away from, from here. When I'm in Australia, obviously, I say from a long, long way away. But um, here's, some, here's some of the symptoms of this new illness. Schizophrenics conduct themselves in a free and easy way. They laugh on serious occasions. They are rude towards their superiors and they challenge them to duels, and they go with a lighted cigar into church. <laughs> Some schizophrenic patients sit about idle and will not go to their work. Schizophrenic patients are often in love with a ward mate with complete disregard of sex, ugliness, or even repulsiveness. <laughs> Some of it isn't funny at all. Perversions like homosexuality and similar anomalies are often indicated in the whole behavior and dress of the schizophrenic patient. This goes on for 200 pages. Looking back, we can see what this is, can't we? This is a list of broken social norms of the time. Lumped together, given a name, and called a brain disease. And it's kind of funny, in a way, or it would be if we weren't still using that basic idea um, that you can lump things together, give them a name, and then think that that name has explained something. We, uh, mental health professionals do that thousands of times every day around the world. And the, the, the argument, well, I remember my very first job, and I asked as a nursing attendant, and I was desperate to understand what was going on, and I said, so you, you, you said you told me that this person was a schizophrenic. How do you know they're schizophrenic? Well, they're hearing voices, John. Okay, so how, how, how do you know that it means they're schizophrenic? Well, that's what schizophrenics do. This is backwards circular logic that five-year-olds use, with no offense to five-year-olds. Um, it explains nothing, but the idea that we have this word that can explain why people do things. And um, people actually believe, they really think, ah, now I know why Susan's hearing those voices. She's a schizophrenic. She's got schizophrenia. And it even gets more bizarre than that because we use that same ridiculous logic for depression. Why are people depressed? <coughs> well, they have this thing called a depressive disorder that is causing them to feel depressed. It's very silly. Um, Anyway, because we are going to be talking about this thing called schizophrenia, we do need to establish that it doesn't exist. Here's some, um, two of the probably several hundred studies that show that there is no such thing, which is not surprising given that you've just got 200 um, pages of broken social norms. Um, we'll do this one first. Um, by 1992, there were 16 diagnostic systems around the world. And uh, this group of researchers decided to see how many of 248 patients would be diagnosed schizophrenic by these 16 different systems. And the answer is between one and 203. Um, this is the most wonderful um, experiment in the history of psychology, in, many, in my opinion. Um, we wouldn't be able to get it through ethics today. But um, how many of you have heard of the Rosenham on being sane and insane? Mm. 
a few, good enough of you that it's worth telling the story then. Those of you who know it already, you'll know it's worth repeating. Uh, Rosenham was a very, very naughty um, American psychologist in, at a time when um, doctoral students were far more obedient than they are today. He, he told eight of his doctoral students to ring up the local hospital, psychiatric hospital, and say that they are hearing the words thud and empty. And it was naughty because he, he knew exactly what was going to happen. They didn't know what was going to happen. But what did happen was that all of them were admitted to psychiatric hospital immediately. Seven of the eight were diagnosed with schizophrenia because they were hearing voices. And then they had to try and get out. And explain that actually, they're, well, I'm, I'm normal, I'm not a schizophrenic. They had to try and get out. And they couldn't get out. Well, they're not still there. <laughs> but it took them a long time to get out. And they had to keep notes of what was happening the whole time. And when Rosenham went in afterwards to look at their medical records, he would find things like bizarre, schizophrenic-like note-taking behavior. <laughs> and it is, it is funny, and it's also tragic, because once you get this diagnosis, everything you do is seen through that, through that filter. He, uh, the, the psychiatrist and the hospital manager were not very pleased about this. And um, they said it wasn't fair because you didn't tell us that you were going to do that. Um, so Rosenhan said, okay, let, we'll do it again for 12 months, January 1st, December 3rd, and I'll come back at the end of the year and you tell me how many I sent in. And of course, now the psychiatrists were on their best behavior. They, you know, they got their diagnostic manual out and read it for the first time, probably, because um, usually they don't even bother reading it because you can tell a schizophrenic. You don't need to look things up. Anyway, so now they were looking it up and counting the symptoms and comparing with one another and doing their best scientific behavior for the whole year. And Rosenham went back at the end of the year and said, okay, how many did I send in? And they decided that it was 13%. 13% of all the patients that year, they believed were Rosenham's fake patients, but he hadn't sent any in at all. <laughs> A uh, very naughty man. Anyway, today we're much more scientific, aren't we? We have the DSM, DSM-5 now, in fact. Um, we don't have 200 pages anymore, we just have five. Five types of symptoms, and you need two of them to get the diagnosis, because we're scientific now. Uh, an eight-year-old could tell you immediately what's wrong with that, if you only need two out of five. If it isn't immediately clear, I'll do it for you. So I'm going to split you down the middle. You lot have got hallucinations and delusions and nothing else. And on this side, we'll give you thought disorder and catatonia and nothing else. So these two groups now have nothing in common at all. Same diagnosis. Understand? Same treatment. You're all now on antipsychotics because it usually takes about 30 seconds from the diagnosis to the prescription of antipsychotics. Slight exaggeration, sorry, 24 hours. This is what's called in science a disjunctive category. Or in ordinary language, absolute rubbish. <laughs> it has no place in science what, whatsoever. Only in psychiatry could a construct like this be uh, perpetuated and used. And this is not just a scientific issue, this destroys people's lives. So it's very important to know any of you, any clinical psychology students in the room, or anybody really, every time you use the word schizophrenia, you are talking rubbish. Just it won't stop you using it because sometimes you'll be in a situation where everybody else is using it and you kind of kind of have to a bit. But just know that it's rubbish. Okay, enough of that. So, causal beliefs. Um, it's interesting, there's a, a, a huge divide between what the public believe and what some professionals believe. So we'll start with the public. Um, in all of these countries, um, and Denmark isn't there um, because the study hasn't been done. But so in all of these countries, when you ask people what are the causes of schizophrenia, or psychosis, or people who hear voices, it doesn't matter how you put it. Um, they prioritize psychosocial things like poverty, loneliness, unemployment, abuse, and so forth. They're not stupid, they have biogenetic stuff in, in there as well, but it's um, down the list. 
down the bottom of the... They look like this, so Germany, for instance. Um, and pretty much everywhere. There's one exception. It's a country that gets everything wrong. They just can't help themselves. They just... From foreign policy to beliefs about mental illness. Um, actually, they don't completely, because this is, this is from a large review of this literature we did recently in, in our book. Um, it's about 50-50 of the studies in America, biogenetic, psychosocial. They're bombarded, to be fair to the American public, they're absolutely bombarded with drug company ads day after day. If you're ever in America, you're in the hotel, switch to telly on, every third ad is for um, a psychiatric drug. It's astonishing. Um, everywhere else in the world, almost everywhere else in the world, um, has a psychosocial model. This is important, of course, not just in terms of it's interesting scientifically, but um, it means that this is the starting position of most people coming into contact with mental health services. Because people coming into contact with mental health services do not come from planet Zion. They are members of the public, aren't we? So um, that's their starting position. Something bad has happened to me, and I expect to be able to talk about that. Um, just to acknowledge that this battle between biological and psychosocial only happens in the developed world, and many cultures um, in the developing world is completely irrelevant. Partly because, and I'll take New Zealand where I was for 20 years as an example, um, hearing voices is just a part of life. What do you mean, what's the cause of hearing voices? That's like asking me, what's the cause of the sun coming up or the sun? Just a part of life, so. Uh, but, um, back to the Western world, developed world, um, people with the diagnosis have an even stronger psychosocial position than the public in general. Everywhere around the world. So, say in Italy, for instance, 76% of people diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, can identify at least one social cause and only 10% identify a biological cause. None of this makes anybody right or wrong, by the way. This is just beliefs. We'll come on to what the causes are. Um, my favourite study, I was talking to Olga about this last night. This is a study of uh, 306 typical schizophrenics, whatever that means, um, and almost all of them um, did not believe that they had any illness. This is not a medical problem. I do not have a medical illness. This was dismissed as lack of insight, which was then described as a symptom of the illness that they say they don't have. So one of the symptoms, and you can find this in Kreplin, I won't go back, otherwise we'll never get to the end of the lecture if I go backwards. I could read you where Kreplin first said, if people don't believe in this illness, that they have it, that's absolute proof that they have it. <laughs> they have gone further and identified the part of the brain that causes this lack of insight and given it a name, it's called anognos anognososia. I always get it wrong, I hate it so much. Anognososia. So there is a part of the brain they have now discovered that makes you disagree with your psychiatrist. It is funny, but the, the stupidity and arrogance of it is just off the scale. They genuinely believe this. You'd kind of have to, wouldn't you, if, if almost all your patients told you, just don't believe in what you're talking about. I just, I'm not going there. I haven't got an illness. Why do you keep going on about this thing called schizophrenia? I don't have an illness. Things have happened in my life and they've messed me up. You'd have to kind of find a way to deal with that, wouldn't you? You could, if you were in any other profession, start listening. That would be an option. But for psychiatrists, no, it must be another symptom. It must be another symptom. Just as, as a, similar to the way they deal with people like me or Peter Gersher or any, anybody else, we know why you disagree with us, you critics or so. You have this thing called anti-psychiatry. <laughs> and that causes you to do that. I've had that. Ah, John, ah, I just realised why you say all these things. You're, you're anti-psychiatry, aren't you? It's, sort of a, it's a very low-level cognitive function that, 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 um, uh, that they operate at. This is the point where I make the very bad joke. Some of my best friends are psychiatrists. 
which nobody ever gets, but um, I feel I do give them a hard time, but also it's not a personal thing, it's, it's, a, it's a, a scientific and professional issue. Um, just so you know, there's lots of studies also that shows the families of um, people with this diagnosis also have a psychosocial model. We'll keep moving. Um, we contrast all of that with this rather, uh, rather large study, nearly 3,000 UK psychiatrists. I'd imagine it would be the same in Denmark. I don't think there's much difference. It'd be worse in America, worse from my biases or perception. 0.4% um, agree with the public. Again, it doesn't make either side right or wrong. But the, it, what it means is, is this terrible miscommunication goes on over and over and over again, where you've got this distressed person who is feeling scared, vulnerable, maybe angry, who knows, but you know, in bad shape, one way or another, with some bad things that have happened that they want to talk about and get some help with. And there's this other person who has been trained not to listen to any of that, but just to listen just enough so they can count how many symptoms the person's got, so they know which label to apply, so they know which color pill to pick. Now, the miscommunication in that is, is terribly sad, I think. I also wonder how it takes seven years to learn how to count and pick a color. <laughs> but that's just rude, sorry, so I must try and be more polite. So that's kind of sad. Anyway, so the real, the real causes, and this is how I get to do this polarizing, which is rather polarizing. Who is right? Millions of people all over the world, including the majority of service users, carers, and mental health workers, or biological psychiatrists and drug companies. So let's come on to what the actual causes are, what the research says about the causes. And of course, there is no one cause. There couldn't possibly be, because human beings are just more complicated than that. It's an interaction um, of a whole bunch of things. So the more of these things you have, the greater the chance. It's a probabilistic etiological model. It's not a simplistic one. But that's the same. It's not just true for psychosis. It's true for anything. Um, let's look at the two biological ones. Well, let's look at the genetic predisposition. I'm not going to go through all of these. Don't worry. I shall pick two or three of them to highlight the issues. It is important to note that there is and never has been and I can safely say never will be any evidence for genetic predisposition. Yeah. When I look at that list, I, s I see a lot of uh, causes that don't give most of the population schizophrenia or psychosis or anything. I mean, lots of people have been bullied. Mm. They don't get psychosis. Yeah. But if you say there's no uh, genetic predisposition. OK. What I said was, so I'll say it again, was it's, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of a combination of these things. No one thing by itself. In a, I mean, very rarely a, a, a horrific war trauma or a horrific rape or something like that can trigger psychosis, but usually not. Usually it's a combination of things. So your chances of getting it are increased, as I said, depending on how many of these things you get. So you don't need a genetic predisposition to differentiate um, so somebody who's bullied, for instance, they're more likely to become psychotic if then they go on to be uh, bullied again in their next place they go to, or to then be raped, or, or whatever. But the bullying by itself probably wouldn't cause a psychosis. So it's the, it's the severity of each of these combined with the number of these that differentiates who be, who's likely to become psychotic. It's more complicated than that even because then there's the psychology of it as well because people respond differently to different things. So somebody, one of the biggest determinants of um, people who hear voices, whether they end up in a psychiatric system, is how, what they tell themselves about the voice, the psychology of their response to the voice. So it's very, it is very complicated, but you certainly don't need a genetic predisposition. Um, for two people who are equally bullied, and one ends up psychotic, one ends up depressed. Well, let's have three because one ends up one end, one ends up just fine. Yeah, because not everybody who's bullied and you know, people come through it. Um, the other bit I haven't mentioned is the amount of support people have at the time. So there's a whole heap of things that um, address the question, the good question that you're asking. Um, 
There just isn't any evidence of a genetic predisposition. It won't stop, the, stop them telling us that there is a genetic predisposition. It won't stop them researching it. They have finally, after 60 years, admitted that there is no schizophrenic gene, um, which they would have wasted literally billions of dollars looking for. Uh, there's no schizophrenic gene, they acknowledge, but now they're looking for hundreds of little baby genes that interact with one another. So please keep giving us the money. Um, I asked at a genetic conference about three or four years ago, when you get to the end of all this, um, what percentage of the variation do you think you will have accounted for? And they said about, probably about 10% in another 20 years or so. And I couldn't help saying, at that point, will you give us all the money back? It's an astonishing waste of money. Not a single person in mental health services has ever benefited from genetic research. And what were we going to do if we did find the schizophrenic gene? Do we want to narrow the gene pool in, in some way to get rid of these unusual experiences or people who have them? Um, so, the uh, research that has the, the best evidence to support these things as causes, uh, the strongest relationship is poverty, which is the strongest predictor of just about everything in the mental health field and the health field in general. Not because, just to reiterate the point, not because it causes anything by itself. You can, if, you, if you've got at least barely enough to eat, you can grow up in um, extreme poverty and be just fine emotional. Um, but because it's a predictor of all the other things that um, have a more direct relationship, direct causal relationship. But recently we've learned that even more powerful than poverty itself is uh, relative poverty. So this is what uh, relative poverty defined by the gap between the income of the top 10% in the population and the bottom 10%. I don't know if Denmark's on here. No. Um, so this is the, the greatest amount of income inequality and greatest amount of um, severe mental illness. And the good old USA gets it wrong again. Um, the UK and Australia and New Zealand are catching up quite fast because all of those countries are cutting benefits in the last five years, so the gap will be getting bigger. So that's a, a major predictor. And then I'm going to talk about um, what I've researched most, which is the relationship between child abuse and um, psychosis. Starting with just the numbers in our psychiatric hospitals around the world, which doesn't prove causation, but um, tells us uh, we should be paying attention. That's just physical and sexual abuse, and if you add in other types of childhood maltreatment, you can see when you combine those together, you're going to be getting up at the 80-90% mark. And then there's things that, you know, not everything is about bad things that people do to one another. Some things are inevitably sad and um, potentially damaging. Again, by itself, losing your mum, if your dad's you know, there to support you, and it, as all sorts of other support, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, it's in combination, I stress again. So the people with this diagnosis are 12 times more likely to have had mum die before the age of 10. These are just the sorts of things we ought to be asking people about in clinical situations, in case it's happened and in case they want to talk about it. So by 2005, we put out the first review of this literature. It was considered quite controversial at the, at the time. Um, we got a lot of international media coverage. We like this one in, the, in Newsweek in the USA. The cumulative impact of this research has swayed opinion in the profession's highest echelons. And I can remember sitting in the pub thinking, with, a, with all the other people who wrote it, thinking that would be very nice. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> um, studies continue to pour out after that. I can't keep up with them anymore. This is the one I, I like to cite at um, psychiatry conferences. People who had experienced five types, the five types of trauma that were researched in this particular study were 193 times more likely to be diagnosed psychotic. 193 times. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2008, I um, was asked to do another review. Uh, I said no, because uh, it's enough already. 
Uh, but they, this particular journal persuaded me to do it by telling me that their journal went free to the 20,000 psychiatrists, 20,000 psychiatrists in the USA who, mo who were most involved with schizophrenia and psychosis. And when you're a bit grandiose like me and you think you're some kind of social change agent, <laughs> that's kind of hard to turn down. So I did it. And afterwards I, I, I emailed them and asked them, wait a minute, how do you, how do you know which 20,000 psychiatrists are the most involved in psychosis? And when they told me the answer, I felt so naive, it was embarrassing. Um, they said, that's easy, John. The, the drug companies every year send us a list of the 20,000 psychiatrists who have prescribed the most antipsychotics in the previous 12 months. That's how organized the drug companies are. That's how good their research is. Um, that's what was in that paper. I'm going to have to keep moving on. You might want to know, um, those of you who are beguiled by the biopsychosocial model, um, that the actual model, the inventors of that model, did not say that the um, vulnerability, you know, the stress vulnerability argument, mm -hmm. that you have to have this genetic predisposition um, before you get any of these things, depression or anxiety disorders or schizophrenia, um, and then a certain amount of stress will tip you over the balance if you have a strong predisposition or weakness. Um, it's always been assumed that um, that predisposition, that vulnerability, has to be genetic. The people who invented this model said the opposite. <clears throat> no, they didn't say the opposite. They said it doesn't have to be genetic. The, it can be that vulnerability to anything can be acquired itself from things like trauma, perinatal complications, family experiences. So don't buy into a biopsychosocial model that says you have to have a genetic predisposition. Um, by two, just to finish this part of the story, by 2012 we had enough studies that we thought we'd do a meta-analysis, um, which for those of you who don't know is a, is a particular kind of literature review. It has very rigid rules about what sort of studies you can include. Um, and by this time, there were so many studies that we were able to pick 41 that were really rigorous. Um, and we found that people who had suffered childhood adversity were nearly three times as likely over, overall. That's after controlling for everything else, including family history of schizophrenia. That's what it looks like, but I don't want to bore you with that. This is a more digestible version of it. These are the six um, types of adversity we looked at. And again, after controlling for all the other things, like family history, drug and alcohol, a whole bunch of other things, poverty, um, the odds ratios were as you see there. So now most people have moved on and are talking about <clears throat> how is it that something that happens at age five or eight can increase the chances so, he so heavily. Note on said increase the chances, not cause. That's important. Um, how does that happen? And there's a whole bunch of um, psychological models that people are using to try and understand how this works. They all have their place. They're all, I think, equally valid and useful. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. The cognitive one is uh, leading, not because it's the best one, but because they just do more research than the rest of us psychologists put together. So they, when they make a claim for something, there's usually 10 studies behind it. When a psychoanalyst makes a claim for something, it's probably equally true, but they can't be fucked to do the research. So they just say, well, I know it's true, John. I'm a, I'm a psychoanalyst. <laughs> so I, I, what I'm trying to say in a rude way, the psychodynamic ideas are very useful, I think, for helping understand how these things come about. Um, I just wish they would do more research too. <laughs> I'll talk about the, the traumagenic neurodevelopmental one, not because it's the longest title, <laughs> probably because it's mine, so there's more, more narcissism here, um, but because it is important to incorporate the brain. There this battle between psychology over here, or social and psychology over here, and brain and genetic over here is kind of a silly one. I, I play the silly game myself, as you have seen tonight already. Um, but here's, some, here's a way where we can actually incorporate the brain in a meaningful way. So, um, at many, uh, pretty much all schizophrenia conferences I've been to for the last 30 years, 
at some point, some idiot will put this slide up. And they will stand in front of it and say, look, here is the evidence that schizophrenia is a brain disease. You can see it's a brain disease. Normal schizophrenia. Smaller overall, larger ventricles, so on. So these people who say it's got something to do with life events, they're talking rubbish. It's a brain disease. It's a biological phenomenon. Now, in every other branch of neurology, um, they wouldn't make that assumption. They would put a slide up like this, and then they would talk about the complexities of what might have caused that. So in these conferences, I put my hand up and say, excuse me, what do you think a brain is for? And they go, oh dear, there's a stranger in the house. <laughs> and I say, well, let me spell it out for you a bit more. What, what good would a brain be that didn't respond to the environment? And then a little light bulb goes on for some of them. Oh, mm. So what I'm trying to say here is every time you see this, it doesn't matter um, what that word is there, the first question you ask is what happened to this, this group of people? This brain exists inside a person, that person exists inside a social context in their life. It, may, it still makes me cross, I'm sorry. Um, 2001, we put out a paper to try and address, to try and speak to these people, the people that we call the context-less brain researchers. Um, here's the evidence that you'll read in every textbook, psychology textbook, social work textbook, psychiatry textbook. This is what's wrong with the brains of schizophrenics, if we must use that word. Um, and by the end of the century, we finally knew for the first time what was going on in the brains of traumatised young children. We didn't know that before. The research started to come out in the 19, early 1990s. So by about 2000, we did know um, what was happening in the brains of young children who were um, grotesquely sexually abused or, or severely and regularly beaten and terrorised one way or another. And we wanted to see if there was any overlap at all between this list of things which proves that schizophrenia is a brain disease and has nothing to do with life events and this research um, about what happens to the brains of young traumatised children. I'll do that again. It's exactly the same. Okay. This has been a useful paper. Sometimes you put papers out and nothing happens. You wasted your time. This one has been cited over 500 times and, and the nonsense is decreasing a little bit. The, you know, the brain has got nothing to do with life events. We have, we have changed the research agenda. I say that sounds arrogant, but we have. Um, but what we have to change now is the real world agenda of what, getting this translated into, into practice, which is a harder battle. Um, we've just updated that, this is a bit boring. At that point there was only a few studies we updated, it's now 125 studies supporting that model. Okay, um, a little bit now to the real world, beyond research, although we'll still be citing some research, but this, we're getting closer to the impact now of the research on the real world. And the first part of the impact is about stigma. Everybody in the field and everybody in this room would agree, I assume, that um, there's a massive amount of stigma connected to this diagnosis. Um, studies show that all of those things, um, people connect. All of these things have been found in research to be uh, a part of the stereotype of the schizophrenic. Um, but there are three, not responsible for their actions, dangerously violent, and unpredictable. Now, you could not invent a more toxic stereotype than that. I challenge you to come up with three things in combination. Hello, I'm John. I'm dangerously violent. I'm unpredictably dangerously violent. And when I am dangerously violent, I can't help it. It's not my fault. Can I be your friend? <laughs> it's, it's, isn't funny, but it, I mean, it is funny, but it's kind of... Uh, this, uh, there are studies showing, surprise, surprise, that some people with this diagnosis find the reactions of other people to the diagnosis more distressing than the symptoms themselves. Um, so now we have all these, these destigmatization programs. 
um, primarily based on teaching the public. You've heard this, I don't know, this translates into Danish, that mental illness is an illness like any other illness. Do you have that sort of, yeah. It's well meant, it's intended to bestow the dignity role of the sickness, the sickness role, and it's particularly intended to remove blame. Because if you're not responsible for your behavior, how can you, you someone be cross with you? It's not your fault. So it's well intentioned. Um, here's the World Psychiatric Association, starting a huge international destigmatization program, trying to teach the public that it, this is the target now. If you can get the public to believe that it's a debilitating disease, you've done your job. This is sophisticated and knowledgeable. Just by chance, funded by, guess who, your local drug company, Eli Lilly. I can't imagine why Eli Lilly would want us all to think that these things are biological phenomena and illnesses. How effective are they? Well, they're not. In 1961, this is how long they've been trying to get the public to change their mind, basically. You remember what the public actually thinks? So this is how long they've been spending all this money to get them to think like that. In 1961, the US government put out a report saying that the principle of sameness as applied to the mentally sick versus the physically sick has become a cardinal tenet of mental health education. Psychiatry has tried diligently to make society see the mentally ill in its way and has railed at the public's antipathy or indifference. So this has been going on for nearly 100 years now. Um, and despite all these efforts, um, attitudes have not improved. And some reviewers are saying that attitudes are worsening. Partly because the public, as you've seen, just refuses to buy it. The public, were well, very, very arrogant and stubborn, the public. Uh, they seem to be quite stuck on this ridiculous idea um, and will not move from it, however much uh, millions of dollars is spent by the drug companies to persuade them. Um, the other reason it doesn't work is because biogenetic causal beliefs make it worse. It's a review we did some time ago now, um, showing um, these uh, 31 studies we identified, oh, this is fairly recent actually, by 2013, and 31 studies looking at the effects of biogenetic causal beliefs, which is the aim of these destigmatization programs. Almost all of them made, made it negative attitudes worse. That's a specific example. I'll skip, I will skip some specifics. Um, these slides are, will all be available. Um, I'll just focus on this study, which has just came out last year, because it isn't only in the public, uh, amongst the public, that there is a relationship between biological beliefs and negative attitudes. Professionals also, within the professionals, what they're human beings too. Here's a crucial study that just came out. The more that mental health professionals believe in biological causes, the less empathy they have for their clients. Clients also, not many of them have a biogenetic belief, but when they do, it damages them. Surprise, surprise, they make less effort to improve. Well, why would you? If you, if you take on board, I've got I'm, you know, something irreversibly wrong with my brain, my genes are fucked, I said. Can you try harder to improve yourself? Well, no, not really. <laughs> um, enough. So, uh, Metronas in 2013. It's a mixed, it's a mixed message. Biogenetic causal beliefs do decrease blame. They do do that. But they increase pessimism about recovery for obvious reasons, because it's a permanent state of affairs, and they increase um, perceived dangerousness. The other target of destigmatization programs is to help the public label more effectively. If only the public could understand that this is schizophrenia, this is depression, this is PTSD, and they're not just crises or responses to life events, they're real diagnosable illnesses and they should be able to diagnose them properly. If they could do that, then stigma would go down. This one I don't understand the logic of. I do, I do understand why they wanted the biogenetic causal beliefs, they were wrong, but I at least I had a logic. I don't get the logic to this. Um, the public who can diagnose schizophrenia accurately, rather than calling it a crisis, or this person's a bit messed up, or I'm, I'm distressed, or whatever, the ones that apply the label, yes, they're more likely to um, believe in biogenetic causal beliefs, but they're also likely to do all of those things. And the two key ones probably are pessimism about recovery, that the person is 
it, again, irreversibly the way they are, and desire for distance. Just keep them away from me. Um, here's something that makes me particularly angry, beginning to think I'm an angry person. I suppose I am a bit about some of these things. Um, not only, do you think it's bad enough that they try and impose this stuff on their own culture? In the last five years, they have this thing called the Global Mental Health Initiative, which is taking these wonderful ideas that have screwed up millions of people in the Western world and exporting them to these poor, impoverished, developing countries. Actively, a lot of, again, drug company money, sending psychiatrists out to Africa, India, and so forth, to teach them. Um, there's this term, they're mentally health illiterate, these people. Um, and this includes their cultural and personal beliefs. Interventions aimed at increasing the mental health liter lit literacy of traditional healers are essential. We cannot have these traditional healers going around doing what they've done for hundreds of years and talking about spirituality and possession. And we must teach them the medical model because it is so good. Um, do you think that, you know, in 2015, having, uh, colonization was not a good idea, was it? <laughs> I, thought, I thought we'd got that. The arrogance of these people is awful. They genuinely believe us, you know, the good old white Christians who first arrived in, all over the world were bringing, bringing enlightenment to these poor, ignorant people. They genuinely believe it. They just happen to be fucking wrong. Um, even within America, he's, he's within, in America, they're doing, putting particular effort into getting Latinos to buy a medical model because they apparently particularly reject the medical model. So especially their failure to make illness attributions and the insistence of Latino people in America that, quote, the social world is important in understanding psychosis. This has got to stop. <laughs> I'll skip the essentialist thinking. This is a social psychology attempt to understand um, why biological beliefs are particularly um, damaging. But I don't have time to go into it. Let's talk about treatments and uh, leave enough time for discussion. So again, well, because um, obviously all these causal beliefs are of direct implications for the sorts of treatments we offer. Yes, that's obvious. So let's start with the public again. Um, again, at, as the country isn't there, so Denmark isn't there because the study hasn't been done there, not because um, the result is different. Again, there's only one country that differs, same country. Um, but in all the countries other than the USA, um, we ask people, what's the best approach to helping people with psychosis or schizophrenia or hearing voices? And they all say talking. And talking therapy is far better than medication. Um, the, the first part of treatment, of course, is, is, is assessment, because if you don't assess properly, you don't know what you're treating. Um, so I'll start with some good news. In 2007, the, the British uh, Psychiatric Association asked us to write up the programme we'd been using in New Zealand for 10 years on when and how to ask about child abuse. So that means some of this is beginning to filter through to the, to the real world. Um, in 2008, in the UK, the National Health Service guidelines came out for the first time saying that all clients must be asked about trauma and abuse and neglect, and all staff must be trained in how to do that. That doesn't mind, mean that's happened, it's just guidelines, and I worked as a clinical psychologist for 15 years and never read a single guideline, because you're just too busy getting on with the work, so I'm not, I'm just, I'm not naive enough to mean that that's happening, but it's a step in the right direction, I think. Um, and before we move on from the, this issue of asking, I just need to, um, in case there's anybody in the room still under this, this illusion that you shouldn't ask psychotic people about trauma because, well, because they're psychotic, because they're mad, because they'll imagine it or whatever, and I've heard that so many times over the years. What's the point, John? What's the point of asking schizophrenics about child abuse? If they tell you it's happened, it's probably a delusion. Um, 
So this may not be necessary for this audience, but I have to make sure it's in all my talks because just in case there's one person in the room who hasn't got it yet. Um, there is not a shred of evidence that this group of people are any more or less likely to disclose sexual abuse or physical abuse that did not happen. Okay. Um, people do make false allegations of these things. Um, but this group of people uh, do not do it any more than anybody else. It's just important to, to know that. The implications for treatment, they're fairly obvious, I guess. Um, give people an opportunity to talk about their understanding of their problems. Um, drug, drugs are not enough. And then there's, um, when you get stuck in what you should do in a treatment situation, um, you should always fall back on this uh, ethical principle of informed choice, which means you lay out in front of people a range of options, including medication, psychological treatments, doing nothing. When are we going to learn how to offer, should we do nothing for a while and see how that goes? Uh, I wish the first week of work, every mental health professional's training was spent saying one sentence over and over again, and the sentence would be, I don't know. The pressure on us to fix people and to fix people quickly is, is um, not good. You have to you have to follow up that on. It's not enough. You can't say I don't know and go home. <laughs> you have to say I don't know and but perhaps together we'll be able to figure something out. But I don't know. I'm not gonna. This is the right thing to do. Take these meds. Take this cognitive therapy. Um, we're too. Um, I guess bossy is the one. Um, you can't talk about treatment, obviously, without talking about antipsychotics. Um, it's a treatment of choice still, despite all the evidence. And here's just one example of the evidence. Here's a Cochrane review of Risperidone. Um, uh, Cochrane reviews are regarded as the most objective, <coughs> scientific. Uh, rigorous. So this is a review of risperidone. Risperidone appears to have a marginal benefit in terms of clinical improvement compared with placebo in the first few weeks, but the margin may not be clinically meaningful. That's not just a vague term, clinically meaningful. It means a very specific, it has a very specific meaning. Clinically meaningful in these sorts of trials means can anybody see it? Because you, if you've got a 0 to 100 scale or something, you can get a two or three point reduction but nobody, the patient, the doctor, or the relatives, can see it. Um, the global effects of the overall is no clear difference between risperidone and placebo. I'll say that again. No clear difference between risperidone and placebo. And that's in the context of these horrendous adverse effects, which we'll just touch on in a second. And then they conclude, now this is bizarre, Cochrane reviews almost always conclude with something like, well, the research wasn't very clear. We need more research. On the one hand, it could be this. On the other hand, it could be that. We're not sure. This time they said, people with schizophrenia or their advocates may want to lobby regulatory authorities to insist on better studies being available before wide release of a compound with the subsequent beguiling advertising. Um, this is just a, well, it's not silliness really. Um, we all have our fetishes. I'm not going to talk about my embarrassing ones. I will talk about the fetish I have of collecting drug company advertisements in the British and American journals of psychiatry for 40 years. This is probably my favourite in the 40 years. So here we have Thorazine, the wonderful new wonder drug. And here's, you can't quite see it, this is a medallion that hangs around the neck of the Ashanti people. Um, to ward off evil spirits. This is, so that was their approach to dealing with what Western psychiatry would call schizophrenia. A primitive, a very primitive approach compared to the sophistication over here. Um, what's neglected to be mentioned here, of course, and to be fair, they didn't know it at that point, so this is a bit unfair, John. But um, since then, many, many studies have shown that the average recovery rate in the developing world from this thing called, you know, defined by Western definitions called schizophrenia, the average recovery rate is two thirds. The average recovery rate in the Western world with all our wonderful diagnosis and psychiatrists and medication is one third. And here's some of the adverse effects of these um, drugs. And this, there is no other medicine that comes close to the damage done by these drugs. 
possible exception of chemotherapy, I suppose. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't have time to dwell on these, but I'll just mention, make sure you understand. There's clear evidence that these drugs reduce lifespan. How much is debatable because there's a very high rate of cigarette smoking and poor diet and so forth that you have to tease out. But the best guess at the minute from people looking closely at this is that it's about 10 years of, of life. Um, I will skip antidepressants because we don't have time. They also have no benefit compared to placebo. Um, but I'll keep moving, so I won't leave time for discussion. Uh, I'll just show you one naughty, one naughty bit of our... This is, we did the biggest survey ever of people on antidepressants. 83% um, of them found the drugs worked for them, experienced the drugs as helpful, and then we were a bit naughty and asked them how quickly they worked, about bearing in mind that there's no chemical effect of antidepressants for four weeks. Um, but they worked ever so quickly. This doesn't mean they didn't work, it means it's a placebo effect, and there's nothing wrong with placebo effects. Placebo I mean, is Latin for I please. A lot of what our psychologists do, if we're doing our job properly, is placebo. We get in trouble for saying this, but what I mean by that is the installation of hope, the expectation that you, you're going to get better, um, and the fact that somebody's doing something. Um, it's very powerful. Okay, elephant in the room. I have to mention the elephant in the room. Um, in the whole of mental health field, the drug companies now control so much. If you don't at least mention them in any talk, in every talk you do, you're kind of just missing something very really important. So, uh, everywhere, drug companies, we have to have some way of understanding why we do these silly things. This is a simplistic explanation because we all have to collude with it for the system to carry on. So just blaming drug companies is a bit simplistic, but... Um, <coughs> DSM-5, for instance, 85% of the people who wrote, who were on the committees for DSM-5, which just came out last year, were in the pay of drug companies. So it's not surprising that they've widened the scope of um, disorders for which um, pills are the primary treatment. Here's a little study we did of, uh, of the internet, because of course now people get most of their information from the internet. M more than half, just over half of websites on schizophrenia are drug company funded. And surprise, surprise, those, those, um, those sites espouse a biogenetic rather than a psychosexual cause. Here's some good news. I'm coming to the end now. I'm going to end with a few quotes from different people in different parts of the mental health system. And, um, He's a very brave president of the American Psychiatric Association, Stephen Shasty, who 10 years ago said, if we are seen as mere pill pushers and employees of the pharmaceutical industry, our credibility as a profession is compromised. As we address these big pharma issues, we must examine the fact that as a profession, we have allowed the biopsychosocial model to become the bio, bio, bio model. It's the head of the most biological psychiatric association in the world. His English counterpart at, at that time, Mike Shooter, put it a little more succinctly when he said, I cannot be the only person to be sickened by the sight of parties of psychiatrists standing at the airport desk with so many gifts with them that they might as well have the name of the drug company tattooed across their foreheads. <laughs> this is in encouraging, I think, for the, the, the head of the psychiatric associations are speaking out. Um, finally, the implications for primary prevention. We've talked a little bit about implications for treatment of individuals, but there's a much bigger, broader set of implications if we know what the causes of mental health problems, not just psychosis, are. We really do need to try and put a little more focus on um, primary prevention and lobbying our politicians to do things that will prevent um, psychosis and other mental health problems. Um, if you just cast your mind back to that meta analysis I talked about, when there's the six different types of childhood adversity, we did a, a calculation. Uh, I don't understand the statistics of it, to be honest with you. And it's a thing called estimated population attributable risk, and thank God there were other people in the group who did understand the statistics of it. 
But um, it basically, uh, uh, so it was 33%. What that means is if we could magically eradicate those six childhood adversities, the abuse and the neglect and the loss, which of course we can't, but if we could, 33% of psychosis would disappear. Um, that's um, important, I think. So I'm going to end with a hero. I started with a villain. It's important to have heroes as well to keep you going. My, one of my heroes is George Alby, who was head of the American Psychological Association. He's got one of those heads that if you turn him upside down, he looks exactly the same. <laughs> but um, we won't hold that against him. Instead, we'll end with a rather powerful quote. He came, and he came to Auckland, where, where I was living, and gave a, a rather wonderful speech. And he ended it with, with this. So, I'll steal from him unashamedly and end my talk with this also. A psychologist must join with persons who reject racism, sexism, colonialism, and exploitation, and must find ways to redistribute social power and to increase social justice. Primary prevention research inevitably will make clear the relationship between social pathology and psychopathology and then will work to change social and political structures in the interests of social justice. It is as simple and as difficult as that. Thanks very much. My name's Marian. Um, I want to say two things. First of all, there was a comment from behind in the beginning of your talk that uh, if two people experience the same thing, how come that one um, reacts so-called psychotic and the other doesn't? Um, I, I'm amazed at this kind of argument time and again because in my experience I haven't met two people yet who have had exactly the same life story. There are always some kind of differences. And in my experience, the devil is in the detail. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, you, you, had the, uh, you, you mentioned blame, that, that the medical model is reducing blame. And I would say, yes, of course it is, both for the person who's labeled because it's not their fault then, uh, but also, and I think this is maybe even more important than uh, the influence of the pharmaceutical industry and of the money, it reduces blame for everybody around this person. Agreed. That is family, and it is also the wider society. I mean, if, if uh, it's all down to individual pathology, we can't blame poverty or, or uh, family abuse, things like that. And these things don't matter, actually. And also, I would say, say that there's um, shame lacking in this equation. Because I see a whole lot of shame in people who believe that they are somehow um, biologically, genetically different and inferior to those uh, so-called normal people. And I see them all the time, and the way they walk through life is like, like this, with their heads down, and, and looking on their shoes, and oh my god, I'm <coughs> schizophrenic, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have the same worth as somebody else. Well, I guess I have three questions. Uh, the first is that uh, the few psychiatrists that I've uh, talk to with regards to especially Peter Gutsche and his research uh, with regards to, I'm thinking specifically uh, with regards to how antipsychotic drugs don't work and so forth, um, they tend, the, uh, the criticism of him tends to be that he cherry picks his data. Second question is that you wound up saying that, if I heard you correctly, that placebo is, you know, uh, installing hope and you know this is what causes uh, betterment in patients. Mm -hmm. um, if if I'm not completely off, I heard um, Peter Gutschup at a conference, and he said that th this is not the case. Placebo does not work better 
uh, like if, if patients aren't giving pl placebo, they will still show betterment. This is just the body healing itself. Uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on that. And I'm afraid I forgot my third question. <laughs> It'll come back to you as soon as you stop thinking about it. <laughs> the accuracy of Peter Gersh's uh, analysis of uh, drug studies and so forth. I've heard Peter speak and read his books. I think he's infinitely more accurate than the majority of people who research and talk about these, these drugs. So, uh, he's head of the, uh, the Cochrane Group and he's, I think, a very reliable reporter of the, of the research. Um, it, which makes it particularly hard to take in because the, what he's reporting to the world people don't want to hear, obviously, and the vicious personal attacks he's getting at the moment are awful. Uh, on the placebo issue, I think both are true. What I mean by that is that, um, yeah, people people do get better as a result of uh, the placebo effects like hope and, and insulation, you know, expectation that they're going to get better. And people also get better from doing nothing. So I think both, both are true. Most, most things, certainly including psychosis and certainly including depression, are things that usually, but not always, but usually pass with time. Like nobody is psychotic all the time, for instance, but they have that label that suggests that they are schizophrenic all the time, but um, psychosis or hearing voices or whatever comes and goes, and certainly depression does. So often when you're depressed, if you do absolutely nothing, six months later, the majority of those people will not be depressed anymore for a thousand different reasons. As, as you said from the front here, there's no two life histories the, the same. So. Um, and the, third, the answer to your third question is yes. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> right, well, um, let's see if you still agree. Oh, you because I remember my third question. Right? Now you're going to change the question. <laughs> well, um, Is schizophrenia um, a biological brain? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, now this, well, this is more maybe, a, a, not exactly a question, maybe just a, sort of a reflection. Good, or whatever. good, good. Um, I was just thinking, because you've complete, well, throughout the entire talk, you've had a very... Uh, large focus on saying what the psychiatrists call schizophrenia, which mm. doesn't exist. Mm. Um, well, so far I've only heard you saying that it's the causes, uh, the, uh, the conception of that term is wrong. Mm. However, I, I think is it not fitting to, to somewhat have a term for these people who have had this massive child trauma which has caused these brain differences, which maybe uh, causes these different hallucinations and, and um, voice hearings and so forth. I mean, if we have a term for it, uh, I mean, it's, it's easier to, well, I guess, to conduct good research. The question is just how to evolve this term in a more, um, well, in a more positive direction. Okay, well, some research is not enough, in my view, have adopted is just to stop using the term schizophrenia and talk about specific experiences and research those. So like voice hearing and delusions. And God knows that's hard enough to define. I understand it's not a perfect construct. Like what one person calls a delusion is not what another does. But at least it's, uh, it, it's, it's more of a focus and more of a sensible construct. So we have um, very good research now into the various causes of hearing voices. Bearing in mind again, your point at the front that there's no, there's no two trajectory is the same, everybody's got a different life uh, history, but um, there are there are patterns in the causes of hearing voices which are completely different from, not completely, somewhat different from delusions. So, um, yeah, we just need to uh, focus on specific measurable constructs, I think. I, I was just thinking that uh, with Peter Gucci and, and this idea of the cherry picking, um, which is always a, a, an argumentation, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the, the, the research that should disprove the cherry-picked research never is produced. And actually Robert Whittaker, when he wrote his book, uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic, um, he actually, and that's in 2010, he said, um, please, if anybody uh, uh, has some research that should disprove this, idea that psychiatric um, medication and the treatment of, of people with distress 
uh, is not working, well, you know, uh, come, come with it. He's, he's thrown that out. And it's been out there for, for now, what, five years. And so far, nobody, nobody has been able to produce these um, research articles that, you know, has apparently been hidden somewhere, uh, you know, so uh, right, in, in, with regards to cherry picking. So I, think, I always think that's very interesting when we get that one thrown, thrown out. Uh, um, so uh, I think it would be really quite good to, you know, once again ask, produce them, let's see these articles that uh, are being missed, because we're an awful lot of people who want to see them. Um, and then I was thinking with, uh, uh, with the regards to, um, to the label of, of uh, schizophrenia, I, I, I think that all people, we all of us, have a need to um, try and categorize. It makes life simpler if we can sort of put uh, things into sort of boxes and stuff. And so, yes, we, we do try and, and put um, names onto things, um, which can be useful in terms of a communication. But actually, it's what we do with the, with the labels. And the trouble is, when you label somebody with the word schizophrenia, you actually can end up destroying their lives. Now, I'd like to just uh, describe what it's like. Um, I was sitting in front of a psychiatrist. This man, he says to me, Olga, you have an illness called schizophrenia. And I said, no, I don't. And he says, yes, you do. Now, what that meant was that I disagreed and I ended up in a closed ward uh, for about seven months. And during those seven months, my life, as I knew it, was destroyed completely and utterly. And the whole thing about it is, it's words. It's only words. Nobody has ever taken any kind of blood test, brain test, or any other kind of test whatsoever to prove that I had this thing called schizophrenia. It was a word. It was done by a man to a woman who had considerably more power. And that word was enough to destroy me and my life for 10 whole years. For 10 years. I was given up upon and I was placed as a chronic schizophrenic on the highest Danish pension because there was no possibility of any kind of recovery whatsoever. Now, this is just a word, but it's a very, very powerful word. And it is a soul-destroying word. Now, I today call myself a voice hearer, and I am proud to be a voice hearer. I am part of a great and fabulous tribe of people. And we are part of a group who is traveling the world and we are actually part of the whole recovery movement and we are defining ourselves. We are part of something that I can be proud of. And this is, there's nothing wrong with hearing my voices. I don't care about that. So I think there's a big difference. That's all I wanted to say. Before Christianity, and you know, a thousand years ago in Denmark, uh, thought was thought to come from the air and the animals. So Odin's thoughts were coming from his ravens, from thought and memory. And in the Ulysses, Odysseus, Iliad, thoughts were coming from fishes or gods. So as since Christianity and, and the institutionalized, institutionalization, I've been drinking some whiskey, um, of guilt and shame, which makes it something that we own, that we need to constantly deal with, and hence it becomes something strange when you are vulnerable. Uh, and then it becomes something that you hear. And to the question earlier on, uh, as in how can we understand schizophrenia, in humanistic psychology from the 50s, which you forgot with Foucault, I'm sorry, schizophrenia is often seen as a developmental thing, which happens when you somehow are caught up in enmeshment with your family, and you can't uh, individualize yourself. 
that's, that's a basic humanistic psychological construct that you can't uh, manage and function independently. And hence you become caught up with hearing your anima or whatever energies there are instead of being them. And uh, yeah, words are, words, words create realities. And uh, thank you for your story. I think that is, that is one of the, the many pathways. It's one of, one of many that I mentioned. And we, have, we, will, we must get caught up with the one answer uh, or one cause. I, I, that's just my belief. <coughs> but not all, because none of, none of it fits for everybody. So different pathways. Yeah, thank you for your talk, and I was uh, especially moved by your description of the miscommunication between the psychiatrist and the patient, uh, one trying to tell uh, his or her story and the other one uh, looking for the symptoms. But I th thought that, uh, isn't there also some kind of miscommunication between you and, and, and uh, some other researchers on this uh, um, uh, on this issue of, of uh, schizophrenia being real or not, because I think uh, uh, a lot of psychiatrists and, and researchers, they, they just say, okay, if, if people deny that schizophrenia exists, they are lunatics, they are not worth discussing with, they are not a part of the, uh, the group of researchers that's worth taking seriously. So, uh, so my first question is, is it, is it possible uh, through the journal that you're edit, editing and stuff, is, it, is there some kind of communications with other uh, parts of the research community or you just uh, uh, not heard or dismissed as anti-psychiatry and not making sense? And, and the other question is that um, many psychiatrists say when, when, when this criticism comes up that that they don't listen enough to trauma and life history. They, they say, oh yeah, but the thing we do, we listen to people, but, but it's very important that we, uh, we have to give the people the drugs first, because it's only then it's possible to talk with people. It's only then, only then is it possible to, to do talking therapy and stuff like that. And, 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 but other people say, maybe it's hard, very hard to do a real therapy with people on drugs. What are your thoughts on that? This, this issue of not being heard <clears throat> by people who do believe there's such thing as schizophrenia, yeah, I think there is some missing between the two groups. Um, the group that uh, is evidence-based and does not use constructs that don't exist is getting larger. So I, you could ask the question the, the other way around. Do, are, we, are we dismissing them because they don't use evidence-based constructs? And to some extent, I think we do. So there is some lack of communication between the, the two groups. There's a huge a gulf when uh, one group of people wants to talk about and research something that the other group is quite clear does not exist. Obviously, that's going to cause some some problems. It's a little bit like the parallel of some of, of, of psychosis itself, in fact, um, when something exists for one person and not the other. It's, kind of, it's an interesting parallel, but uh, that's not a very good answer. I think that, yes, there is some, there's a, there's a gulf there. Um, uh, and I don't know how to um, gulf that, or bridge that gulf, those of us who look at the research. That's well, not fair because, of course, they look at the research as well. Um, we don't have much time for them, and we think they're doing a lot of damage. And we don't not only think they're unscientific; we think they're dangerous. So we can't. We are kind of dismissive. And then of us, yeah. Uh, the argument you left out, which is actually thrown at us a lot, is if you say schizophrenia doesn't exist, don't you understand that these, those people are really suffering? That's the argument I get more more often. How how dare you? How uncaring of you, John, to try and say that these people are, people aren't suffering, which of course is not what we're saying. We're saying that you can't help. It doesn't help you understand or assist these people by calling them this thing. 
Anyway, that's a long-winded, not very helpful answer. I don't know. Um, listen, uh, listening, but getting them on medication so they can do talking therapy. I think there's a grain of truth to, to that for, for some people some of the time. I think some people are so out of it that these drugs can help uh, if they're used temporarily and in small doses. Um, because what they are is they're very effective tranquilizers. That, that's all they are, and they are that. When they first came out in the 50s and 60s, they were called major tranquilizers to, to differentiate them from the minor tranquilizers, the Valium and Libyan and so forth, which offended the people on Valium and Libyan because, fucking hell, these are pretty major tranquilizers, what do you mean? But, so anyway, they, sorry, they, they were called major they, they are tranquilizers, and I think there's a role. I can imagine being so out of it that I'm pleased to do something to calm, calm me down. Um, and if used properly, it, I've seen it very rarely, but I have seen it used up front. We're going to do this for two or three weeks, and then we're going to have a plan for getting you off it, but we, you really need to be able to connect and talk about it. If you're too out of it, um, this is the plan. And if it's done collaboratively, in that way, I think I've got a lot of time for that. If you go back far enough in history, in the 1930s, um, they used to use chloral hydrate just to put people to sleep. It was called sleeping therapy. <coughs> Had no side effects whatsoever. Because part of what happens, as you, any of you who have been through it or work in this field will know, is that you start hearing voices and it gets, can get scary and you lose sleep and sleep deprivation. If, if any of you have not heard voices and would like to, just don't go to sleep for the next three nights. Sleep deprivation. I mean, so I think using drugs to just put people to sleep for two or three you know, would be, is a good idea. So I'm off the point now. I tend to do that. <coughs> Definition of thought disorder in the DSM is um, tangential thinking is whether or not you can find your way back to where you were. And I can't, so... <laughs> there's increasing evidence coming out that um, this therapy isn't working that well. Now, most of it is the CBT again because there's so much research going into that. And uh, actually, Peter uh, Butcher and the Cochrane Institute are, are uh, doing some research on that. And it looks like, uh, according to what Peter was saying, um, it's again uh, the effect of the drugs. We're using so many drugs that the ability for people to actually be able to relate and work through their things uh, is um, is uh, decreasing. Uh, so it's not uh, necessarily because the therapy uh, is not working, but it's uh, because of the increase in drugs. And there's um, this connection that uh, yeah, seems to be uh, was going to be coming out. Just I thought. Yeah. So it can it can work both ways. That's what you're saying. You can a medication can facilitate it if it's used temporarily in low doses, but if, if it's used yeah. the way it's normally used, it gets in the way of therapy. It gets in the way of therapy, and what we're no. doing nowadays is people are just on tons of drugs no. and for long term. Uh, so this idea of, of uh, people um, uh, being able to work through mm -hmm. their things when they're on a uh, large yeah. amount of drugs doesn't work, is, yeah. what, is what it's showing. So, if, yeah. so a temporary one uh, with a couple of weeks, oh well, goodness, yes, yeah. uh, that's really helpful. Let me just add to that, yeah. oh, because the, um, for, decade, well, yeah. for two decades since CBT for psychosis was invented, um, it was not possible to research CBT by itself without medication. So all the studies until two years ago, pretty much, were CBT plus medication because it was considered unethical to take people off medication to do the research. But recently, a rather wonderful person and a wonderful research team in Manchester, led by Tony Morrison, got away with has found a way around that and has just, uh, just published a uh, quite large study on CBT for psychosis without medication. And the way he got around it is fun. And then I'll tell you the outcome of the study. Um, he got around it by taking the 50% of people who have been on medication and therefore been offered it, but throw it away because of the side effects. Because about 50% of people throw it away within three months because it's either it doesn't work or the side effects or, or both. So they could not say it was unethical because they had been offered the medication and actively decided they didn't want it. So he then did research on, on these folk, um, who psychiatry would describe as the treatment resistant ones, you know, because when drugs don't work, it's called treatment resistant. I love that. Um, anyway, so he had this group of people and did a research with CBT 
without medication, and it works, surprise, surprise, just fine. Thank you very much. Not for everybody, because nothing works for everybody, but a statistically significant uh, effect. And then, here's the most interesting part for me of, of this story, because I'm not a fan of any particular model. People who get very excited about CBT or psychodynamic or DBT or whatever frighten me, uh, because I think it's just, because they all work a bit, and people need different things. So I don't like zealots about models. So this, this is why I like this particular outcome. And the outcome is um, that researchers have gone into these CBT studies and looked at what is the effective ingredient. Because of course we all thought it was the CBT techniques. And, and, I, and I think they are helpful, don't get me wrong. But the most effective ingredient, I don't suppose anybody in the room, or you tell me what was it? The connection, the, the, the quality of the therapeutic relationship is, is what predicts, and that's what predicts everything. In that study on antidepressants, which I whizzed through, the best predictor, sorry, one of the best predictors of whether they thought the drug worked was whether the doctor understood their problem. Don't you love it? I, I gave a talk, uh, to my astonishment, I was invited to give a talk on the placebo effect to the, uh, the uh, huge uh, British uh, uh, international psychiatry conference and 5,000 psychiatrists and me, so uh, talk about paranoia. Um, uh, and so, and I, I, I gave them all the placebo studies on ECT and antidepressant antipsychotics and, and then concluded, I was trying to be friendly and humorous and said, it, it's okay, what you do works, but it isn't the chemistry and it isn't the electricity, it's because you're nice people. It's okay, don't be scared. <laughs> So that's what it all boils down. And my, my naive sort of, I've only ever had two ideas as my partner keeps pointing out to me. John, how did you make a career out of ever having two ideas? And they're two ideas that everybody else knows already. <laughs> so thank God for biological psychiatry, so I would never have had a career. So um, the first idea is bad things happen, they fuck you up. And the, and the second one is if, if your problems are, have been caused by human things like other people treating you not as well as human beings should, then probably the solution is a human being treating you really well. <laughs> That's all I have to say, really, but it's nice that people invite me around the world to, 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 to say that. And, and thank you for all of you who are doing that work, because all I do anymore, I did it for 20 years, but now I just talk about it. So thank God there's people like you out there actually um, doing it in all the different ways that, that you do. And we probably should leave it there, I think. Thank yeah. you very much yeah. for doing so. So okay. thank you on behalf of uh, Form for Essential uh, Psychology and Therapy. And I think I'll give the last word to Olga from the Hearing Noises Network. Well, I want to say also thank you very much. And uh, me and all my voices in the collective are very <laughs> happy about uh, your talk today. And um, I'm thinking you might have been slightly more critical and usually I heard you, I overheard, one of my voices anyway, heard something about um, you were thinking that with, uh, with uh, me and uh, sort of being part of the organisation of this group here, um, you'd be amongst friends. And uh, I think you are. So anyway, thank you very much. And uh, pleasure having you. Thank you.